Hey, I was a conscript in the South African Army in 1988 and 89. Used to have to do two years. 1989 was the last year of having to do two years of compulsory military service as Nelson Mandela was led out of jail and we moved towards the first free and fair elections in South Africa. But I, I was based up in northern Zululand near a town called Matubatuba uh, in 121 Battalion, which was a Zulu battalion with a small cadre of white officers, but all the troops and a lot of the non-commissioned officers were Zulus. And one of the things that was going on in my area, because I was the law officer covering a very large area of northern Zululand up to the Swaziland-Mozambique border, was a small group of recce officers. That was like our equivalent of the SAS, um, Navy SEALs type uh, soldiers, training local Zulu men to go up to the townships um, and the mine hostels around Johannesburg and in the Transvaal to deliberately foment racial tension and violence with other tribes based in those hostels and townships. And this was a very deliberate strategy of the South African government and the South African military at the time to create black on black violence, to detract from uh, the potential for black on white violence, which in those days was very low because we had a very strong and violent police force repressing that side of things. But there was this massive deflection that went on right up until I left the army at the end of 1989. And a lot of white people don't know that, is that there was a very deliberate strategy because what white people in South Africa at the time and no doubt for some period afterwards were often saying is, you know, these blacks can't run a country because they're always fighting each other. These tribes hate each other, right? The Zulus hate the Kozas who hate the Ndebele, who hate this guy, the Pondos. And this kept saying that basically that, that blacks were too violent to run a country. And what most people have no idea of is that that violence, that intertribal violence, was fomented by the white South African government, army and police force very deliberately. So we need to revise our idea of history, not just the recent history, the pre-apartheid history of South Africa, but the entire history of European and white domination of Africa and the way that that was presented to us through our education curriculum, the things we believe about the history of Africa and colonialism are not what actually happened and are certainly not how Africans experienced that. Let's bear that in mind, people. Come on. Hey, this is absolutely true. It's almost as if Africa had no history prior to the arrival of white Europeans. And that, of course, is completely absurd. But what it means is that an entire centuries of history have just been erased as if they didn't exist. And nobody can be bothered to recreate and teach that history because, hey, why bother? But one of the things, just one of the things to note is that the richest man in history, in all of history, a man whose wealth made Elon Musk look like a fucking peasant, was a king in northern West Africa called Mansa Musa, who was so rich that it is estimated that by today's standards, he would be worth $500 billion. And Nobody knows that. Well, I say nobody, but you have to really dig in to find that out because we think that all culture, all wealth really just emerged from Renaissance Europe. And we point to African history and other parts of the world as saying, look how uncivilized they were. Look how they were always fighting each other. Look how they just killed each other. Look how they hadn't invented things. Look how they lived this nomadic subsistence lifestyle. And we, white Europeans, changed all of that during the Enlightenment and with the Industrial Revolution. But what did we really change? Okay, we upped the standard of living, but at what cost? And that's why I talk about colonialism so much, is that it's as if... Prior to that, Europeans weren't 
tribal little groups killing each other at random, having constant wars. Italy was only a country, made a country in the 1800s. We think that Europe's history is unsullied series of developments. Um, and we look at Africa and say, well, it wasn't developing until we came along. And that's just horseshit. It was. We just weren't privy to that history. Right. And and so we only look at it from that white European perspective. And that's distressing. It's the same for South America. It's the same for Asia. And what Europeans are now calling revisionist history is actually just the discovery of the real history. So come on, people, let's have an open mind to this and let's look to the source of history rather than Europeans' very convenient rewriting of it. And I know that I've got guys in the comments going, that never happened. It's like, mate, I was there. And the reason I know this happened is not because 121 Battalion was directly involved in this, but because we had bases at Jusini and Dumu and these places and these recce bastards would come out of the bush from doing this training and get drunk and talk too much. This was not something being done by one to one battalion. This was being done by or facilitated by the reccees and other units um, and covert operatives in that area because it couldn't be above the line. It was below the line activity. And the trouble was, the only reason I know about this is because these psychopaths would come out the bush when we'd be sitting around a braai on the uh, Mozambique border having a nice time and they would completely fuck up our lives by their aggression, their stupid games, their drunkenness. These were miserable psychopathic people, man. I used to hate it. There were many, many times when I would rather go and sleep in my truck in the bush than be in the base when these guys came in because they were awful, awful people and they were doing awful, awful things. Yes, tribal animosity existed. But we took it, we weaponized it, and many, many people died as a result.